Joe. I know you've ordered a good lunch, and uh, hopefully I won't put you asleep too much. So, um, first thing, I thought I could get away with maybe just doing one slide for my presentation. So that was my idea of doing that. I'm trying to pack as much as I could as one slide. Uh, talk about where we are, what we're doing, what I'm going to try to do, and there's two solid reference to Boston where I'm from. I thought maybe that would be a good start. Um, thinking more about it, I want to add a little more. So um, let's see what we're going to talk about. My name is David. Um, this is where you can find me on Twitter. Um, I talk about technology, uh, I post some photo, talk about my family and random other stuff. Uh, I'm also the uh, co-founder and CTO of Tracker, which is a company that was started in uh, Cambridge which now has offices in San Francisco, Boston, London, and a few other places around the world. Um, we've been around for about five years, and we've built a technology, a SaaS product, um, that lets our customer find, discover, and manage influencers. Uh, influencers are people that are active on social media, they're opinion leaders, they're community leaders on social media, um, and we have a technology that lets our customer find them based on topics. So you go to Tracker, uh, you define topic, usually based on keywords, um, and our customer um, will discover, will let them discover um, uh, people's profile or influential on social media. Uh, here's an example of the kind of result um, that you get. Uh, we manage quite a bit of data. Uh, we go and crawl social media and aggregate all of the data that we find. Um, our technology stack um, is pretty deep. We uh, use all of Java, uh, MongoDB, and Elasticsearch on the back end. Uh, and on the front end, um, everything is built around a uh, LAMP stack. And uh, at the center of it is Cake PHP, which we've been using for about, about five years now. Uh, we started with Cake PHP 1, uh, we migrated to 2, and on our roadmap for the next few sprint, uh, we have planned with the migration to 3. So it's going to be coming up soon. Um, as Bert Reynolds would say, enough about me, and uh, let's get going on what we're going to talk about. Um, so there will be three parts of the talk here today. Uh, we'll talk about how you can create a custom cache. Uh, cache engine uh, in Cake PHP. Um, in particular, we'll look how you can create a Redis cache engine uh, in Cake PHP. And finally, we'll look at a fallback cache engine or a failover cache engine. Um, so, pretty um, simple, um, simple version, simple idea, uh, but it's been really helpful to us. Um, so, I wanted to share that with you. Um, bit of a word of advice. This is not meant to be a tutorial on how to do it. Uh, we're not claiming that's the only way or the best way to do it. That's the way we did it. Uh, what I want to try to do is tell the story about what we did uh, and you know what we ran into. Um, hopefully, they'll give you ideas, inspire you to um, do better and do other stuff. So um, that's the first one. And the second one is, um, as I was mentioning, we're using um, Cake 2. We haven't done Cake 3 yet. The, uh, a lot of what I'm talking about will be is targeted for um, Cake 2. Um, I'll try to point out when um, there's differences with Cake 3, um, and I'll try to just point it out through, uh, through the talk. Um, the code is available on GitHub. Um, I'll post it on the, the form that someone created a little earlier. Uh, in particular, there are two branches that you want to look at. Um, the DVLP branch is where um, we have what we're talking about, and Cake 3, the experimental branch where we're doing the migration to Cake 3. Um, and those um, cache engines are also available through Composer uh, when you want to install them. All right, so let's get going with the custom cache engine. Um, so why do you want to create a custom cache engine? Well, when we started um, developing Tracker and uh, the first version of our um, customer-facing application, um, we started with a lot of the default, right? Uh, and by default, Cake usually use the um, file cache engine, and that worked very well for a while. Um, or your caching, when you're doing caching, is, is stored locally on your, on your file system. Um, eventually, you get to the point where, uh, for one reason or another, you want to just get something a little more than that. Um, you might want to uh, use a distributed or centralized um, um, cache system so you can share stuff like your session, for example. Uh, you might want something that's a little faster than the local file system. Um, there might be any reason why you want to create your own cache engine. So, um, Cake comes with a few um, other cache engines than file. We'll talk about that. But uh, when you want to do even more than that, you're going to have to create your own. So, how do you do a, a custom cache engine? How do you build something like that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Um, there's a base class called Cache Engine, um, and you're going to extend it to create your own custom class uh, cache engine. 
a uh, little bit of difference here in, in uh, Cake 3. Um, there's a namespace you have to apply. Um, so same class, but it's uh, located in a different place. Once you create your own um, class, uh, obviously you're going to want to overwrite a few methods. Um, we have a few of the classic. Write, which lets you put a value in your cache. Um, read, which is going to let you read that key back. Uh, and delete, which is going to let you get rid of that key. Um, most of the cache uh, lets you also set an expiration time on the key. Um, so the key will expire on its own after that, but you also have the ability to delete when the data, for example, is invalid. Um, there, there's an increment and decrement uh, function as well. Uh, if uh, you're using your cache to uh, store a counter, you can use that. Uh, clear will clear the entire cache, move all the keys. And clear group, um, either way to um, clear some key that have been tagged uh, with a, a group name. A uh, couple of things to look for or to look at, pay attention to. Um, put the key function. Um, that's actually an interesting one. There's a uh, default implementation available. Um, that function is here to help you create keys that are safe uh, for your storage engine. Whenever you're storing your key, uh, you want to make sure that the string that you're using is going to be safe um, for that storage engine. Um, so for example, um, that function will do stuff like take a, a key, for example, project name, and convert it uh, by removing maybe the spaces. Um, if your storage engine doesn't support spaces, uh, maybe putting lowercase, uh, that's something you need to do. So it's a way to translate your key and make sure it's um, safe for your storage engine. Um, the other function is init. Uh, we talked about configuration in another talk yesterday. Um, this function is automatically called when you create or initialize your um, cache engine and your cache. Uh, and that's when you're going to do your custom configuration. Uh, anything on top of the basic stuff you're going to want to do there. And we'll see uh, an example of how we do that a little later. How do you use uh, your custom cache? Well, we choose to um, create as a plugin. Um, so uh, you just simply drop in the plugin uh, directory. Um, there's actually a, uh, an installer, a composer installer, that's uh, very good at um, doing that if you uh, put in your composer or JSON um, and you just um, composer will automatically put in the right place. So that's very convenient. Um, there's also a version for uh, Cake 3 uh, where the plugin has to be in the vendor directory. Uh, and there's a separate um, installer for that, the, the Cake PHP plugin installer kind of works the same way. Okay. So let's recap what we talked about here um, so far. Um, if you want to create your custom cache engine, if you want to extend the cache engine class, uh, you might want to look at, uh, in particular, um, imp um, implementing some function like init and key. Uh, pay attention to them if you need to. Uh, and finally, you're going to want to install it as a plugin. Okay, so we know how to create a custom um, cache engine, uh, and we look in particular at a um, Redis cache engine. The first question you should ask is, but why? Um, Kate comes with a Redis cache engine, so why would you want to create your own? Well, two words, um, cache invalidation. Um, anybody who's done any work with caching know that putting a key in the cache is easy, reading a key from the cache is easy, um, potentially letting a key expire is easy, uh, but invalidation can be a little more complicated, right? There might be a uh, different business logic part that uh, trigger uh, invalidation. Um, one piece of data being invalidated might mean multiple keys that need to be deleted, so it can get a little complicated depending on how you structure your cache. Uh, in particular, our tracker, uh, we store a fairly large amount of data uh, for our customer. Uh, they're managing projects with many influencers across many projects. Um, when we use Redis, and we decided to use Redis for our um, um, uh, cache engine, um, we decided to structure our key using the, uh, the schema I'm describing here. Um, this is a convention that Redis uses, where if you use colon, uh, you're essentially creating a, a namespace for your key, um, to make a uh, just semantic using of the key, um, and we um, separate that way. So essentially what you're creating is um, a, a namespace for your key, uh, where your key are organized in a, in a tree structure. Um, so you can create multiple keys, for example, uh, for the, this project of ID 123, we uh, are going to put all the user um, cache data in here, in that key, assets, metadata, et cetera, et cetera. The problem you still have is that if you want to delete your keys, you still have to delete them one by one. Um, so when something changes in your project, you might have multiple keys to delete. You know, keep track of that. Um, so what I wanted to do and say, well, 
if our kid organized in this tree, what I'd like to be able to do is delete node one, two, three, and then get everything underneath that um, deleted, right? In other words, I'd like to be able to say I want to delete project one, two, three, star, right? Anything that's underneath um, um, that, that node, I want to be able to delete. And this way, all my keys are deleted all at once. Even better, I'd like to be able to do delete key project one, two, three. Um, don't have really to specify the star or anything like that. The system will know it is a, a node in my tree of keys and um, delete automatically. And same thing, have all my keys being deleted right there. So enter the uh, Redis tree cache engine that we created, a custom cache engine for that. Um, and what it allows us to do is just call the delete function we talked about by just, just giving the name of the key, uh, which happened to be a node in our tree here. Uh, and we'll delete all the, uh, the keys that are underneath that. Um, just a little set back to look at Redis and how it works, just a little reminder for people who are maybe not familiar with that. Um, let's look at some of the um, commands that are available in Redis. The set command lets you set a, a value based on a key. Get will get the, uh, the, the value for the, a given key. Delete, where you can delete one or multiple key uh, all at once. The keys function or com command that will return um, a bunch of keys that are matching a pattern. And extra bonus, the um, um, s add function that will add um, a member to a set, um, which is a different uh, type of data structure in Redis. So the thing you want to notice is that the only command that you the pattern here is the uh, keys uh, command. Uh, delete only delete one key at a time, uh, or more than one at a time, but you have to specify each key um, individually. So how do we leverage that? So how do we build our um, custom Redis tree engine? Um, so let's look how we did the, um, the write function. Uh, it takes the key and the value as we've seen before and, and we overrode that, that function. Um, the last thing we're going to do in that function is still uh, call Redis and set the key and the, and the value there. That's going to be just pretty standard. But what we do before um, is we take our key and we kind of break it apart based on the column. Remember we use the column as a, a standard for uh, our key namespace. So we're going to separate it. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to add all those elements, right? That's a path in your tree. Uh, we're going to add them to a set in Redis. So we essentially keep track in Redis itself. Um, we keep track of all the nodes uh, and the path for our keys. Um, we'll quickly over the loop. Um, it's just a loop that lets you handle the different um, uh, element in the path uh, of your key. So what does that do? Well, if I'm trying to save a key like this one here, for example, Project one, two, three, users Dave. Uh, my, my set will have um, three elements to it: the project key for the top one, uh, project one, two, three, and project one, two, three, users. Right. So how do we do delete now that we have that in place? Well, pretty the last thing we're going to do again. Uh, the last part of our function is going to be to actually delete the key or the keys, as we'll see. Uh, that's pretty easy. Uh, but the first thing we're going to do first is see well is the value that's being passed, uh, an actual key or that a node in my tree. Um, so we have a set in Redis that keeps track of all of those nodes, so we'll look if it's there. Um, and if it is, uh, we actually build the pattern search um, for that key, right? We all essentially add the colon star at the end of it. But let us call the keys command on Redis. If you remember, that's the only one that takes a pattern. So we pass that pattern to the command. It will tell us all the key and the set key that are there. Um, we delete that node from our, our set, we don't need any more, and then we finally can delete all the keys. So all of a sudden we've let uh, Redis delete all the keys uh, just based on this on the node specification. Our warning here, um, just so you're aware of it, um, that's from the Redis documentation. Um, keys can be a little um, dangerous, um, if you did in production, because as you can imagine, depending on how you write your pattern, uh, it could affect a lot of keys, right? Um, so you have to be a little careful on how to use that. Um, in our case, we only use the star at the end uh, of the key, so it doesn't completely randomly match. Question over there? Oh, sorry. Um, and, um, you know, whenever we do that, uh, even though our cache is pretty big, when we delete, uh, we might be deleting a few thousand at a time, so it's not that bad. But something you have to keep in mind, uh, depending how your cache is structured and how many keys you might be deleting. Um, again, just so you're aware of it, the actual the implementation of the clear uh, function in the 
Redis engine. Uh, actually, does use also this pattern of the star. So same thing. It's going to delete all your keys, but um, it might be a, a long, a long operation. Um, there's an option that we've not explored. Uh, Redis has a scan command, which I recommend uh, instead of using keys. Um, scan essentially open a cursor to the key, then you can kind of loop through them. So it's a better way to kind of go through your keys. We haven't looked at if that's doable for now, for us or not. Okay, so a bit of a recap of what we've seen so far. Um, we wanted to create our own Redis tree cache engine to facilitate cache invalidation. Um, we overrode the write and delete method to take uh, into account the fact that we might be not deleting not a actual key but maybe a, a node in our key namespace, which trigger deleting multiple keys. Uh, and again, just uh, there's some consideration to take into account if you're doing that in production, depending on the level you're doing that. So we're pretty happy. We uh, we went from the basic. Um, KPHP configuration for the cache. We started using Redis. Uh, we got more advanced with our, our key namespace. We created our own um, Redis cache engine to manage all of that. Um, so what happened next? Well, the next question is, well, what happens if Redis crashes, right? When you lose Redis, what do you do? Um, the easy answer to that would be, well, you can create a cluster of Redis nodes, right? Um, so that, that would be Maybe the basic answer, but why? Why didn't we choose not to do that? Well, a couple of reasons. Um, for one, we're we're a startup, so based on resource and and uh, various resource and time uh, expenses, we decided that would be maybe not the best option for us. Um, at the time as well, um, the Redis cluster configuration was not super good. Uh, it was still experimental, so we're not sure if we wanted to spend time learning and and and, and maintaining that. So we decided we'll kind of look at another approach that could work for us. Um, so we decided to look at creating another custom cache engine called the, the fallback or failover cache engine. Um, we wanted something very simple that, that really worked for us. So the idea is to, um, to have a cache engine that really delegated work to two cache engines. One is going to be the primary that's going to be active. And the second one, secondary, is going to be passive. When the primary fails, you just make the secondary active and you start caching there. Um, very simple. Um, in our case, we use Redis as a primary, uh, and we fall back on the file system um, if we have to. Um, Redis has definitely some advantage to it. It's distributed, it's definitely faster, but you run the risk of losing uh, your server. Um, the file system is only server side. Um, it's reliable as much as file system are reliable, but usually they are. Um, it's obviously a lot slower than uh, a lot of other options. But as a fallback mechanism, it works pretty well. So how did we build our um, fallback cache engine? Um, mentioned the init function a little earlier. That's something that you wanna, might want to implement when you um, create your own cache engine. So that's one of the cases where we wanted to do that. Um, we call the parent just to make sure we initialize all the default stuff. Um, and then, very simple, we uh, configure two caches right there, one for the primary and one for the secondary. Um, you'll notice that they both do the primary and secondary configuration, which we'll look at in a second. Um, and then we just activate the primary. What happens when you try to write a key? Well, we try to write it first. So we just uh, call the cache and write, and we pass it the active cache to try to write to the active cache. Um, that could potentially fail if Redis is down, right? So we're going to try to catch the exception. If that's the case, and we fall back to our secondary, and we just write the key there. Okay, very simple. How the fallback works? Um, it's pretty simple. Um, you have a parameter where you can reset the primary, but if that's not set, then the secondary becomes the active um, um, cache engine. How do you configure that? Um, you got a glimpse at it earlier. Um, configuration is very similar to a um, any um, uh, cache configuration, um, except here we've created two sub uh, configuration as a, for the primary and the secondary. Um, if you notice in the init, that's that's what we grab when you configure our um, two caches. Um, but those configurations are very similar to any other cache configuration. They're also going to specify the engine, which is called name in, in Gate 3, um, and then whatever other configuration you need, um, the server in this case for Redis, or maybe the path uh, if you're using a, a file engine. Um, we've been pretty happy with that approach. It's pretty simple, uh, but it works very well for us. Um, the idea was not to get something that 
necessarily redundant or anything like that. We want it to be able to react when the server goes down or Redis server goes down. It doesn't go down very often, but when it does, um, you know, it gives us the time to go restart, reboot whatever we need to, uh, knowing that the application will not be failing. There'll still be some caching happening. Uh, and everything will be running until we can switch back to the, um, to the Redis, uh, which by the way, we don't have to do anything. We just have to bring the server back up uh, and our cache engine will just try to contact it so that it's there and be back on it. So uh, very easy, very little uh, thing to do when you want to switch back and forth. So as a recap, uh, we wanted a simple full tolerant cache uh, and we implemented that with an active passive approach um, to the cache engine. That's it. I uh, hope you uh, like the talk and uh, I'll make the slide available online as well. Any questions? So what you do in validation, um, being that you may not have known what keys got written to which cache, are you invalidating from both caches? You mean in the case of the fallback? Yeah, I mean, so let's say you wrote a bunch of keys to Redis, then you fell over to the, the file tree one, you wrote a bunch of keys there. So the keys are not migrating from one to the other. So when you fall over, you kind of lose your cache. So that's one thing I didn't mention. We use our cache for non-mission critical data. It's just pure caching. Um, so you, you lose that data. Uh, you'll just start with a fresh cache. Um, that you kind of lose the old data. But for us, it's just caching. So the application will be slow at the beginning, but then just kind of start caching and, and working. So for us, it was not really a um, uh, to have a, a complete transparent transition. It was just that the application keeps on running. We're still doing some caching. Um, we don't want to. We had one instance where Redis crashed and the application just didn't work because it was throwing all sort of errors. So we want to make sure that didn't happen uh, in, in a very easy way. But you do lose your your um, your your keys, um, so you have to recreate them as you go. All right. Thank you very much.